February and March are such focused months for us. In February, we pay particular attention to the contributions of African Americans, contributions often overlooked, forgotten, or intentionally hidden as we continue the seemingly never-ending work of justice. In March, we pay particular attention to women whose contributions are overlooked, forgotten, or intentionally hidden as we continue the seemingly never-ending work of justice. And in this year, these two events happen in the season of Lent. And Lent is not unlike Advent. It's a season of waiting. It's a, a season where we emphasize the journey from the crucifixion and resurrection. And it's a truth-telling season. We tell the truth about our sin, our brokenness. We tell the truth about the evil, malice, and injustice in our world. And it's a season to face all this brokenness and grief, to repent and declare, this is not how it should be. This is not what God intended. It should be different, and it will be different. And so it's in this multi-layered, dense context of race, gender, contrition, and hope, that we come to the story of Ruth. And therein lies the first problem, the naming of the biblical check, the, the book of Ruth. In truth, it is the book of Naomi and Ruth. And it's a subversive book in so many ways, but by referring to this as the book of Ruth, we make Ruth the exemplar or the exception. She's the model minority the exception to the rule, and in the process, we hide the subversiveness of this story and its power to transform our world. In this Lenten time, the truth-telling about our sin and brokenness, our proclivity for division over community, the way that tyranny and fear and competition and so much more, it infects our hearts, our minds, our souls, and it robs us of any imagination for living on earth as it is in heaven. We, we can't seem to live our now out of what we know will be by God's grace. So I invite us to live into new possibilities as we listen to new to this relationship between Naomi and Ruth, as we pay attention to the defiant action that moves to more justice and more promise. Most of us know the story of Ruth, or we think we do. And at the very least, if you have attended any weddings ever, you have likely heard these words spoken. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well if death parts me from you. While you may be familiar with this oath that Ruth made to Naomi, and while you may be familiar with the basic story, this story, this story of Naomi and Ruth, is far more nuanced and complex than our memories and this short scripture can account for. The fuller context involves Ruth's identity as a Moabite. It involves the defiant actions of Naomi and their relationship that refuses to acquiesce to the idea that the status quo is immutable. Why Elimelech, Naomi's husband, decided to drag his family from Bethlehem to Moab is anybody's guess. The text tells us that there's a famine in the land. Well, it must have been a horrific famine because Moab would be the last place on earth that Israelite would go. The Israelites and the Moabites were always at odds. They were bitter enemies, first of all. The Moabites come from the incestuous relationship between Lot and Lot's oldest daughter, when she got him drunk and had sex with him. Yes, it's in there, Genesis 19. Additionally, the Moabs, Moabites did not provide food and water when the Israelites came out of Egypt. And they also tried to pay Balaam, the Moabite prophet, to curse Israel. And you may remember the story about Balaam and his talking donkey. 
The enmity was so great between that, and in Deuteronomy, the book of law, it declares that no Moabite ever, ever, ever shall be allowed into the assembly, nor will the Israelite ever, ever, ever promote Moabite welfare or prosperity. Never, ever. So there's utter enmity and loathing and revulsion, and yet Elimelech moves his family, his wife and sons, from the famine in Bethlehem to Moab. And as strangers and aliens in the land, they are likely looked at with suspicion and hostility. But nonetheless, they make some kind of life there. The sons marry Moabite women. And it's anyone's guess if the lowly status of the women, of those two women, is raised simply because now they're married, or if their marriage to this outsider, these particular outsiders, drops their minimal social capital to a new low. As time passes, the men die, leaving Naomi and the son's wife, Ruth, and Orpah, childless and widowed. No male protector head of household, no breadwinner, no protector, no one to keep the wolves of poverty, hostility, and physical harm at bay. Naomi has been hit with every bit of devastation as Job. Yet she does not sit in the ashes waiting on friends who may not be friends. She's not even waiting on a conversation with God which may or may not happen. Naomi hears that the famine has lifted and decides to return to her homeland after years away. Naomi tells her daughters-in-law to return to their mother's house, an interesting choice of words since men are the head of households, further emphasizing the focus on the women in this story. Naomi tells Ruth and Orpah to return to their homes and offers a blessing on them that God will honor their faithfulness to her and her sons and further that God will provide security and a husband for them. Then Naomi kisses them goodbye. Ruth and Orpah cling to her and weep and refuse to leave. And Naomi the second time encourages them, go, she's, I've got nothing for you. I have nothing to offer you. But it's clear that this small community of women is built on love and respect. Otherwise, Ruth and Orpah would have hightailed it as soon as they could. Naomi could demand that they go with her to Israel, but she doesn't. She tells them to stay with their own people. This is the first glimpse of defiance. Naomi has lost everything but her sense of self and agency. She's got no husbands or sons to serve. There's no one to tell her no. She's about as socially disadvantaged as she can be. And yet, she uses her agency and sense of self to advocate for Ruth and Orpah. She knows what loss and death feels like. She knows what hopelessness looks like. She knows what it feels like to live as an alien and a stranger. But regardless of Naomi's losses, she will not visit the same loss on the mothers of Orpah and Ruth. She will not force Orpah and Ruth into her same insecure, uncertain, and dangerous life and journey, a dangerous journey into an unlikely, unwelcome land. Defiant compassion is what this is. When you put someone else's good over your own, when you're sparing others the best you can from all hurt, harm, and danger. And Orpah returns home. But Ruth, not Ruth. She makes an oath to Naomi, a pledge. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. 
May the Lord do thus and so, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. And off they go. They get to Bethlehem and cause a stir. The women of the town ask, can this be Naomi? But again, Naomi exercises her sense of self and agency. She names herself, do not call me Naomi. Call me Myra, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. And in doing so, she puts God on notice as well. Essentially says, this is your deed. And Naomi lifts her suffering up three times in this chapter. She's not going to just get over this. She's not going to gloss over the loss. She's about to take some action. Naomi is not just sitting back and taking what life deals out. Pain is not her ultimate destiny, not if she can help it. So defiant compassion naming and claiming of self, acting on one's own behalf, literally breaking of all the rules about a woman's place in that society. And it's harvest season in Bethlehem. Bethlehem literally means the house of bread. So Ruth uses her own voice and agency, and she tells Naomi that she will go glean in the fields with hopes of finding favor. She will do her part to support and care for the two of them. Ruth goes to glean. That's a practice that allows the poor to gather the less leftover grains after the harvesters. They follow behind the reapers and catch what's left. While Ruth is in the field, Naomi comes up with a plan to secure their future. Naomi says, in the words of theologian Barbara Holmes, uses her power to spiritually veer from disaster. Naomi has a wealthy kinsman from her husband's side of the family named Boaz, who has property in fields. And just enough, that's where Ruth ends up gleaning. Long story short, Ruth follows Naomi's instructions. Naomi tells her to doll herself up and go to the threshing floor after Boaz and the men have finished eating and drinking. Boaz awakes to find Ruth at his feet, and she proposes to him. He marries her. She has a baby named Obed, and Obed becomes the grandfather of King David. And Ruth finds herself in Matthew's genealogy. Of Jesus. So all's well that ends well. The rest of the story, if you read it for yourself, a little bit racier than this version. Certainly it is restricted or for mature audiences, but you read that for yourself. While more could be said about the story, I want us to go back to this relationship between Naomi and Ruth. We have explored Naomi's defiance born out of a circumstance where she has absolutely nothing to lose. But what about Ruth? She could very well have taken the easy way out, return to her mother's household and hope for her husband. Instead, she pledges this oath to Naomi. This is not the sort of romanticized pledge spoken at weddings as the marriage partners sort of swoon into each other's arms. This is a pledge for Ruth. This is a pledge that comes with significant personal cause. She essentially says, I divest myself of all that I am, all that has shaped me, all that has formed me. I divest myself of my land, my language, my customs, my people, my culture, my gods, all that I call holy. She does this with no promise of acceptance, no guarantees of well-being. The pledge for Ruth is a pledge that comes with significant personal risks. Ruth joins Naomi on a journey filled with possibilities of danger. It could be dangerous animals preying on humans ill-equipped to protect themselves, or it could be dangerous humans preying on women ill-equipped to protect themselves. It could be Israelites who definitely see Ruth the Moabite as fair game, or it could be the Moabites who definitely see Naomi 
the Israelite as fair game. Or it could just be men who see two women traveling alone as fair game. As in any migration, whether it is a forced migration of enslavement, or if it's a migration driven by hunger, hunger for food, hunger for safety, hunger for justice, hunger for freedom, hunger simply to be seen human and valued. Migration is a ter terrific risk. Just ask our neighbors being housed in Woodlawn or those folks that are holding up signs at almost every intersection in the city begging for their children. Ask the immigrants who are shuffled from pillar to post, from police station to shelter, or ask the parents of that five-year-old boy who died of sepsis. Migration is a risk. Migration is a hardship. Migration is perilous. You may die along the way or wish you had. Just like those who've arrived in our sanctuary city, there are no guarantees of welcome. Once they arrive at Bethlehem, there's no guarantee that there will be a welcome, especially for Ruth. Throughout the whole book, she is never simply Ruth. She is Ruth the Moabite, and sometimes she's referred to as Ruth the Moabite from Moab, just in case you didn't catch it. An emphasis that lets us know she really, really is other, a suspicious other. Eyes are on her for no other reason than her Moabiteness, an enemy, someone to loathe or perhaps someone to lust after as an exotic creature. Ruth is an example of what Holmes would call a prisoner of the perception of others. This is a prison where you have no option of jailbreak. For how can you escape free of somebody else's deformed imagination? I like this story much better when I could just think of Ruth and Naomi arriving home maybe to a welcome banner, a warm casserole from the neighbors. I like this story so much better when it was a love story, when we could romanticize it and gloss all over it and, and, and just be happy, because I do love a happy ending. Although upon further investigation, it's not really that happy. With the birth of Obed, Ruth disappears. She is mentioned no more. The ending of the story in chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 say, Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her bosom, and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Ruth disappears, but she is not forgotten. She shows up in Matthew's genealogy alongside another outsider, Rahab. And it reads, And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. A real story is better for us as disciples of Jesus than a romantic remake. Because in this real story, we see the defiance is gospel. We see that compassion is gospel. We see that risk is gospel. We see that courage is gospel. We see that oaths and pledges of solidarity and belonging are gospel. Ruth and Naomi live in solidarity with each other. Solidarity is simply behavior affirming that we are willing to act in support of others. It is a mutuality that overrides self-interest. And we see that that work of solidarity and justice is ongoing. We seem to take one step forward and two backward, even though 
The neighborhood woman earlier declared Ruth a blessing to Naomi. They said that Ruth was worth more to you than seven sons. Nonetheless, Ruth disappears into obscurity. One action, one movement, one hashtag me too, one hashtag Black Lives Matter, one hashtag cease fire now doesn't stop the powers and principalities, not of flesh and blood. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the reason we are called to ongoing solidarity with each other, with our neighbors, with the stranger, with the alien. We are called to an ongoing, unwavering solidarity. For solidarity is a visible form of love. God is love. Go and love likewise. And we invite you to spend a couple of minutes, moments, listening to what the spirit is still stirring. A sight, a sound, a phrase, a disagreement, a question, and how the experience of the spirit is alive in your own. Thank you.